I was my senior pope, and I greet parishioners from quarantine. <laughs> I think a lot of us are in the situation, and so uh, I'll I'll talk more about that my health and what we're doing at the parish, you know, um, uh, in a in a different video. I want to stick to the Word of God here. This is a homily video, and um, stick to the Word of God. I want to preach on this topic uh, today. Um, the uh, that is easier to wear slippers than to carpet the whole of the earth. Now, the gospel opens up, notice the image that's extolled of the kind of a selfless Christ. When Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this, and they followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked, he saw the vast crowd, and his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. Now, we see here that... Um, when, we're, when we suffer a loss or a grief, or sometimes illness or whatever, but especially with loss, grief, it's our tendency to want to withdraw, to be alone, and pray, and think. And that makes sense. Um, but it's too easy for us to just simply do that, that. But it's not a disposition that we should maintain for long, see. Um, we're still called to reach out. Just because I have needs doesn't mean other people stop having needs. And we can't become utterly self-absorbed. And Jesus models this for us because, as I say, um, even in his own grief, Jesus saw the crowds and that they were like sheep without a shepherd. He, he, he mourned, he pitied them, and he disembarked and he healed their sick. Other text says he taught them at great length. Okay, So this gospel opens with that beautiful image um, of, a, of a Savior and a Lord who was in grief, personal grief. But... Uh, Got away for a little while on the boat, maybe, but he, he returned. Because just because he had needs didn't mean that other people stopped having needs. And uh, he overcame his grief by taking care of others. And that's the thing to remember, that very often, even when we're depressed or discouraged, we don't feel like getting out. That's sometimes the very thing we need to do. Because the healing is found in reaching out to others, not staying focused on ourselves. So that's just something to consider as this gospel opens. Now we come to the familiar part of the gospel. Um, there's an issue that's evaded. Um, it says, when it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place and it's already late, so dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Now, there's an issue that's being evaded here. Um, there's a kind of a human tendency that when people are needy, <laughs> We want them to go away, <laughs> to disappear. Um, and uh, when we see a beggar, we might cross the street to avoid interacting or we avert our eyes. Uh, when the caller ID maybe indicates that this is a troubled family member who's probably going to ask for money or just wants to talk a long time or whatever, or the NIMBY effect, you know, oh, well, there's, we should take care of the poor, but not in my backyard. Um, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Uh, there's a lot of this, um, very often the sick and the dying are neglected. Um, and these are just our tendencies. When people have needs, sometimes there's a human tendency to just want them to go away. And there's a little bit of that going on here. Now, you might say, well, their concerns are practical. The people need to go before it gets too much late and buy food, yes. But we know there's more to the story here, and Jesus is going to pull it out of them, right? So again, you notice again that we cannot ultimately evade that there are poor among us, there are needy among us, and not always material poverty. There's an immense amount of spiritual poverty, including ignorance, including a lack of Christian doctrine. We'll talk more about that toward the end. But again, there is this, um, um, but we, we, Jesus basically begged, begged Jesus to, to turn this increasingly troublesome crowd away, to go fend for themselves. But Jesus says, no, no, we're not doing that. We're going to solve this problem together. And that leads to the instruction that ensues. Jesus said to them, there is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. Uh-oh, now this is starting to get personal, right? <laughs> starting to get personal. Uh, he's not willing to just let the, this be a problem that they have, the crowd. Um, um, he wants me to do something, see? And so he says, uh, give them some food yourselves. <laughs> now, refusing to accept the presence of the poor and the needy um, is simply not a viable option for Jesus um, or anyone who would be a disciple of his, right? Um, 
And uh, we can't solve everyone's problems. We can't solve every problem. But there are ways that we are called to be being involved and being part of a solution rather than just telling whole peoples, groups of peoples, whatever, to go away. Go away. Um, you know, go, go, go take care of yourself. Uh, leave me alone. See. So we, we see that um, I'm moving through these 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 issues pretty quickly, but um, we we see that there was an issue that's been evaded. Hmm? Uh, this crowd, they, they're, they're getting needy. Send them away. Um, there's an instruction that ensues. Uh, there's an insufficiency that's expressed. The text says, but they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all that we have here. Now, by the way, it's interesting, in John's account, it isn't even the disciples that had the five loaves and the two fishes. It's a poor boy in the crowd who has his little stash of food. And um, um, so even though they, you know, they're, they're, they're expressing an insufficiency, there, there are some resources out there. And we'll get to that in a minute, but I want you to notice that I think it's important, John's insight, that the solution is not just f from the wealthy or the w better position toward the poor, that there's solutions among the poor as well. Because in John's gospel, at least, that, that those five loaves and two fishes were found by a lad, uh, to be among with a lad in the crowd, the, the poor, the, uh, the, the, the crowd that Jesus pitied. And so one of, the, one of the tendencies we have in our country and the way we take care of the poor is that, that we, we should, we, we've lost this idea that we should not do for others what they can reasonably do for themselves. We need to help them to do that, to, to bring whatever resources they do have, meager though they may be, uh, to, so that they're part of the solution. That's part of human dignity. And just big government solutions or, you know, lim you know according to uh, limousine liberalism, you think know, roll down the window and throw out money. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a terrible expression, but you, you know the, the idea that we, we sort of, uh, we're from the government, we're here to help you. But do we ever sit down and talk to the poor? What would really help? You know, when I was living out in Ward 8, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of meeting and organizing with them, and um, uh, we listened to our neighbors, and um, we worked together, and we eventually built a big $5.5 million, uh, $5 million rec center um, to help serve to get, get those kids off the street uh, and the grounds of St. Thomas More there. And it was really, but it was a long work of working together with the poor and with benefactors and working together. And we identify the elements that needed to be in that center. There wouldn't just be a big basketball court. You know, there was going to be classrooms, one of which was a computer lab and so on. And that center's up and running and being used today. But again, that came after a long discussion uh, with our neighbors. And we had done several other projects and uh, together. And so uh, this is, means working with the poor, not just sort of saying, here, uh, here's my idea. I'm, I've come, I've got a great idea for you. Okay. So not to belabor that, but I think one of the flawed approaches to um, care for the poor today is this sort of top-down approach. Um, so uh, we should not do for others what they can reasonably do for themselves. And there are resources among the poor. It's not always money, but there are human resources, people with talent, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, secondly, again, wh wherever, wh wherever the loaves and the fishes have come from, the point is here that they are not nothing. Five loaves and two fishes may seem insufficient, but the point is they are not nothing. Okay? So, uh, we see then there's an insufficiency expressed. Now we move to the immensity that's experienced. So Jesus said to them, then bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing. He broke the loaves and gave it to them and the disciples, who in turn gave it to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting the women and children. <laughs> that probably means you're about twenty thousand there, then, right? Okay. All right. Now, again, this story is so familiar that you and I are not shocked by the outcome, but. It, you know, no matter how many times we hear it, it we, we have to, we, it's hard to really accept its astonishing truth. I mean, five loaves and two fishes, and yet it, it, it sufficed. It was multiplied. God can take our meager things and multiply them. I mean, what can one small act of charity do? That maybe you're charitable or kind to a person at, in the grocery store who, because of that, is kind and charitable to their family at home. And, and there's immense healing that can go out 
um, from uh, from uh, one single good act. And we also know there's a lot of damage that can go forward with, with one single act. Um, there's a tendency of, there's multipliers in life. And uh, God works with this too. See, he can take our meager things and he can multiply them. Now, you know, we certainly know texts like these, of course, that are the miraculous things um, uh, working together with God that can happen. St. Paul says, I can do all things in him who strengthens me, right? Um, likewise, Mark chapter 9, verse 23, all things are possible to him who believes. Right? Or uh, from uh, Mark 10, for man is impossible, but not with God. For God, all things are possible. And then here comes, I think, the key text from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Again, what again, I ask you, is the power of a kind word, of an encouraging word. And it can have a ripple effect because if you take someone out of a really bad space, they might affect 10 other people. They would have affected them in a negative way. Now they can affect them in a positive way. And those 10 people can be in a better space. And, the, and then it, hundreds, and you see it, it, it radiates out. Do not underestimate this. God can multiply our good works and our good deeds. Um, you think of all these old churches that were built in the old cities of the Northeast um, by the immigrants. These are very poor people. They were built on nickels and dimes that were collected. Um, but look what they built. It's an amazing thing. A, a lot of little things, uh, little things add up to a lot. And so this is an important lesson for us. We may think that there's very little um, we can do about the condition of the world and, or anything like that. But that leads me then to this last point. I want to move beyond just the question of giving bread to the hungry and, uh, and 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 th water to the thirsty. This, these are important. The corporal works of mercy are obviously very important, but there's also spiritual works of mercy, and um, instructing the ignorant. Um, you know, correcting the sinner. Um, you know, admonishing the sinner, and so on. I won't list them all, but the point is instructing the ignorant. You know, all of these types of works of spiritual works of mercy, because people have spiritual need. We pray for the dead, the living and the dead. We 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 lift up, we encourage people who are in, in grief, and and this is a um, uh, a very important work as well. Now we look at the fact also as we look at our world, we're amazed that it's an increasingly a terrible state. Um, you know, I mean. You've heard my list before, but I mean, let's just take a quick survey. If we have to, fall, yeah, let's just so we are on the same page. But, you know, there's a rampant secularism, hmm? a moral relativism. The church has many self-inflicted wounds. Oh, look out there, huh? And um, this has all led to the fact that we have a real mess in our hands, right? So we see that the, the problems often seem to us to be overwhelming. There's sexual confusion, the culture of death, the breakdown of marriage. There's compulsive sin, compulsive overspending. There's greed, racism, insensitivity to the poor. There's deep and widespread addiction to pornography and drugs and alcohol. There's abortion. There's widespread promiscuity, adultery, corruption, cynicism, low mass attendance, and on and on I could go. A lot of cynicism today, too, huh? Yeah. Who can you trust? You know, is that media really telling you all the truth? You know, who knows? This is where we are today. And this is a very painful world in many ways to live in. And the problems seem overwhelming. And so, Lord, well, we'll just dismiss these crowds. Well, get me out of here. Get, you know, take me home, Lord. You know, these could be our immediate thoughts. But the Lord says, no, no, there's no need to dismiss the world. Um, do, something, do something yourself. But Lord, what, what, I'm just one person. What could I possibly do? See? And uh, so remember how, again, Jesus said to the, find those five loaves and two fishes and bring them to me. But Lord, what good, what good is that for such a big crowd? Bring, bring what you do have. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. So what are your five loaves and two fishes in the state of the overwhelming crisis of our world? What are, what are mine? You know? you know, I'm going through a bit of a sickness right now. Um... And um, kind of a sorrow about being the source of quarantine for many a good number of people, embarrassment. So maybe I can offer up my sickness and my humiliation um, for the salvation of souls, for, you, for, your, for your graces. Right? Um, 
you know, the, 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 how, do we, how are we going to bring this world to a better place? You know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with just one step, right? One step. The conversion of the whole world begins with what you do every day and what I do every day, see? There's a huge difference about whether you decide to pray or not, whether you decide to get married and stay married or not, whether you decide to make and keep commitments or not, whether you decide to be kind to the poor or not. And I, I could go on, you see. Um, I, I made a little list of some things here. I hope it's not too long. Some of our loaves and fishes, some of the things that some of us could do um, to um, make this world a better place. We may not be able to become the president of the UN and engage in biggie wild projects, most of which don't work anyway. You know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, how long have these big organizations and blue ribbon panels had all their big solutions? And, you know, until you really reach individuals and they really begin, you know, this, this is going to be a grassroots movement starting with you and me. So here's a few ideas of how we can make the world a better place. I work on my own conversion for a holier world has to start with me. If I get holier, the world gets holier. Right? Number two, I look to the poor that I can serve. Maybe with money, maybe with talents, like tutoring or counseling. Maybe just with time and listening. See? You can't help all the poor, but you may know a few people that the Lord's you sort of know Lord, you sort of assigned this person to me, haven't you? Yeah, okay. Take up your assignment, see? I pick up the phone and call a family member who I know is hurting. See, um, what, you say, what good will that do? Well, it, it could make a big difference. You might repair two households that day. See, you'll help. All right. Um, number four, a person might just simply love their spouse and children. I know that sounds radical, but you know, if you're married, get on your knees every day and say, "Lord, give me a tender love for my spouse." The first time I laid eyes on him or her. I worship the ground they would walk on. And now we're fighting or whatever. I know there's tension in marriage, but, you know, it's amazing to me the lack of love I sometimes see in marriages. And just pray for the grace every day to have a deep, affectionate love for your, for your spouse and for your children. Children can be troublesome and hard to love. And I was never hard to love. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, all right. Um, number five, um, I spend time properly. Raising my children to know the Lord and seek his kingdom. See? And again, how many parents really sit down every, every day, or, or at least several times a week, and read Bible stories to their children? Or have a religious study hour with them? You know, even share dinner together and talk about things. So, again, those are just, you know, the, so this is an extended sense. But how many parents pray with their children, especially when they're young, you know, it's time to tuck them in for bed, teaching them their prayers, and, and, um, that was always a ritual in my house growing up. Um, Mom and sometimes Dad would come and tuck us in and say a prayer with us, and then I uh, went the lights, and we were expected to stay <laughs> to stay in bed at that at that point. But again, it was um, um, uh, it was just part of life growing up. And that's what, a lot of that's changed now. So again, parents really read Bible stories, teach your children about the Lord, tell them about what the Lord's doing in your life. You know what a difference that could make, right? Um, I exhort the weak in my own family and with love rebuke sin and encourage righteousness. You know, there's often, I've mentioned you to you many times before, there are many concerns today about silent pulpits, and that's true, but there's too many silent din dining room tables, too, where sin isn't being rebuked. It isn't even called sin, and there's just a lot of stuff that goes on, and so those who are silent remain responsible. With the, the kind of confusion and things that, that can go on. So I just say, uh, you know, we have to be prudential, but we've, we've got to learn again to properly and prudently correct one another. Um, if I'm a priest or a religious, I am a priest, I faithfully live my vocation and heroically call others to Christ by teaching and proclaiming the gospel without compromise and pray that I can continue to try to do that. If I'm a young person, I seek to devoutly prepare myself for the vocations to either marriage, priesthood, or the religious life. If I'm older, I seek to manifest wisdom and good example to those who are young. Be a good example to them, right? If I'm elderly, I seek to devoutly prepare myself for death and to give the good example in, in this witness, at, in, a good example in this witness to the desire for heaven. Um, 
wow, people that are running from death as far as fast as they can. And I know the natural process of dying. But as I get older, I get happier because I'm getting closer to going home to be with the Lord. I'm like, oh, Lord, one day you'll call me home. And that my, my life's ticking away now. I've begun, I've entered into my 60th decade. And, and I'm like, wow, uh, I, I, I'm getting closer to home, Lord, closer to home. Can't wait to see you. Keep me faithful to death, you know. There's a, there should be a kind of a desire for heaven that the elderly can also manifest. And then finally, you know, for all of us, I will pray for this world. I'll attend Mass faithfully, and I'll beg God's mercy on this sin-soaked world, see? Repenting of my own sins at the same time, see? So you see, it's too easy to simply lament the world's condition, and like the apostles feel overwhelmed, but Jesus says, look, bring me what you do have. Come with me, let's begin with what you can do, see? And I just give you that long list, sorry, it's a little long, but... Uh, some some ideas, you know, because this you don't want to just lock this parable of the little fishes and the and the uh, loaves um, uh, into some distant past, and it's a story that happened then. We we're, we're, we still have overwhelming problems in the world, and we still have loaves and fishes, and we need to kind of actualize it and bring it to our own current conditions. You know, as I say, there's a there's an old saying. Um, by the way, Jesus will certainly multiply these things that we do, right? That's the idea, you know. And uh, as I say, uh, my, my brother and sister-in-law, uh, one of the, one group, uh, my brother, one brother and sister-in-law have nine children. They've homeschooled most of them, but they're a very devout Catholic family. And the same with my other brother and sister-in-law. They have three sons, a devout Catholic family too. And the fact that they raised these kids and will send them out into the world with devout Catholic values is going to make a big difference. And God multiplies things. Okay. Now, there's an old saying that it's easier to wear slippers than to carpet the whole of the earth. Indeed it is, because if, if it's a converted world that you want, you, you've got to start with yourself, you know, and um, bring your loaves and your fishes, you bring your slippers, <laughs> and let's get started. You know, it begins, it begins with me. You know that old song, and Dr. Martin Luther King loved it so much, it just says, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody how they're traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. So that's a good way to end. Um, and um, it's a beautiful gospel. Uh, it's so memorable that sometimes we quickly go through, through it, but it's got a lot of application. We got We feel overwhelmed, but we still got the Lord, so we've got a dog in the fight. <laughs> Bring what you do have. It's easier to wear slippers and to try to carpet the whole of the earth. Amen.